the ninth, 2024, and let us gather together and experience the goodness of God. I'm Pastor Trey Comstock. We'll begin with our scripture of the week, John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31, a piece by me entitled, Congrats, You've Got One Up on Your Biblical Heroes. Then, Pastor Emily and I will talk scripture, and more specifically, that Jesus blesses our journey to faith rather than curses us in doubt. But first, a reading from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my fingers in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet who have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. From generations of people with my job title telling us how bad that we are, we don't expect a lot of positive comparisons to the biblical good guys. Sure, a few times a year we could feel super superior to Judas. We wouldn't take an astronomical sum of money to sell out Jesus? Of course not! Although I thought about quitting my job and joining Michael Bloomberg's failed bid for the 2020 Democratic nomination for president, I did not believe that having several billion dollars or being a former mayor of New York made him uniquely qualified for the White House. I have no memories of a single policy position of his. However, he did promise to pay off his staffers student loans, and for that, I'd probably have called anyone Mr. President. Apparently, I don't even stack up as well against Judas as I'd like. Generally, particularly with the disciples, we get to see a few foibles and stumbles, but they go on to do amazing things that it can feel impossible to live into their example. A group of largely working class guys from an unimportant corner of the Roman Empire, through reliance on the Holy Spirit alone, built a movement for Christ that still stands. They healed miraculously, escaped danger miraculously, and spoke miraculously well. Even in dying, they died bravely for the good news. His amazing faith life took Peter from unknown Galilean fishermen to immortalized in some of humanity's greatest works of art. So far, all I've managed is turning an upbringing of relative privilege and 10 years of university education into a life as an obscure Methodist pastor, and someone made a frankly amazing Muppet of me. So, I find the blessing that Jesus slings our way in John 20 astounding. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. John 20, 29. That's us. We, all Christians after that initial group, have found belief without the opportunity to physically inspect the risen Savior. Thomas gets a bad rap, but over the course of our text, all the disciples see and 
maybe poke and prod at the physical evidence of Christ's death and resurrection. We have to make leaps of faith. They got to apply the scientific method. In rereading this and the other post-resurrection texts this year, I'm struck by how much proof they all needed. Matthew, Luke, and John, and the longer version of Mark's ending, give us scenes of Christ proving himself and the resurrection to his friends. Many of the disciples were scattered and presumably didn't witness Christ's death. But people that they knew, such as the Marys, did. When presented with their now clearly alive again friend and teacher, they seem to struggle. They need to see, or in Thomas's case, touch the wounds. In Luke 24, Jesus goes through multiple demonstrations of how much he is not a ghost. In the longer version of Mark 16, Jesus yells the disciples for not believing the testimony of the women and needing to see him for themselves. In Matthew 28, just before rolling out the Great Commission, as Jesus stands there in front of them teaching, Matthew includes the detail, but some doubt it. They had it much easier than us. And scripture lays out clearly the degree to which they still struggled to comprehend the reality of the resurrection. Thus, those of us who have found faith without inspection of the forensic data have got one up on our biblical heroes. I've always found faith difficult. I love more empirical data, but in a post-ascension and post-Pentecost world, we have to rise to a higher bar and believe without having seen. I appreciate, too, that Jesus understands the difficulty in this task. He may chide the disciples, but helps them find faith nonetheless. We do not seem to have a savior sitting in heaven and shouting down like an armchair quarterback at a missed pass. How could they miss it? It's so easy! Instead, he declares any of us who do find faith blessed. We should all probably adopt this approach. We should stop acting like it's so easy to believe that a dead guy who you never met in person and cannot now meet came back to life 2,000 years ago and that this medically impossible moment can utterly transform your life here and now. After years of struggle, I did come to believe this, and thankfully, Jesus, unlike many of the speakers at contemporary Christian concerts in the early 2000s, empathizes and blesses my journey to faith. To doubt is not anathema. It's human. The disciples had to work through it, even with the advantage of literal, physical Jesus standing right in front of them. We should heed Christ's words. Blessed are those who find faith. Not cursed are those who haven't found it yet. Since you just heard in the piece, and the, the, this is one where if you listen to the sermon, youtube.com slash servants now, um, it's not up. It will be up by the time you listen to this. I am. Uh, I lost an entire day to an eclipse, um, and it was a truly joyous experience, but it uh, means that none of, the, none of the Monday things in this studio happened. That's, um, that's inside wild diversions though i mean that's a once yeah. in a lifetime diversion it's fine yeah. it's fine it's everybody else was off work tomorrow or yesterday too because of the total solar eclipse right. so it, it was yeah. it was it was a it was a huge deal so anyways the, the, by the time you listen to this none of what i'm saying will matter <laughs> because i will have posted all these things all together um right. uh, but anyways so this is one where the both the sermon and the piece um that you have definitely just heard um are very close together. And it is me reflecting on doubt as a person who felt deeply judged, and in some ways continues to feel deeply judged, by how hard I find the faith experience. And so I really, um, and I think, you know, I really hit on this time, and what really connected for me in this reading of it is the blessed are those who come to believe even though they haven't seen, mm -hmm. right? That, like, we get a beatitude of, hey, y'all, this time talking to the disciples, disciples, you've got it easier 
than all the people who come after you. And so while Jesus gets a little frustrated with these guys, um, uh, particularly if you read Mark's version of this, the longer version of Mark is like, Mark, Jesus is like, what is wrong with y'all? <laughs> because they're face-to-face literal Jesus. Here, we, not the disciples, often we and the disciples are in solidarity as the people who don't quite get it, um, as, you know, the people who carry the torch of the Holy Spirit, right? We've got a lot of solidarity with those folks most of the time. But here, Jesus speaks into the difference between us, modern Christians, actually at Gen 2 Christians on, and the first generation of believers who got to poke and prod and see and talk. And next week we're going to read, my favorite is the standoff where Jesus, where they think Jesus is a ghost, a yes. lot of the so we're reading the Luke text, a uh, Luke text next week, um, where it is like I think Jesus is messing with their minds, of like he's holding a fish on a pre- this is a running fish. joke on a previous podcast. So like he's holding a fish, and like in their belief about ghosts, ghosts didn't eat anything, um, and so when he, he and I imagine because again these are men in their thirties and twenties, thirties and forties, and and John mm-hmm. maybe in his late teens, right? These are just like. These are adult, young adult men who have been hanging out together entirely too much. And so you know they made fun of each other in healthy, loving ways, right? Um, That doesn't actually have to be toxic. And so I imagine they did this in a very, in the same way that we get John, last week, we got John mocking Peter for losing a foot race. Right. right? The disciple who made this Who got there first? (laughs) Who got there first. And having got there first, he looked in first, right? I, yeah. So I, 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 I imagine like Jesus like holding the fish and then biting it, like, like really is messing he with be their able? minds. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Am I a ghost? Am I a spooky ghost? I don't know, guys. Um, but he, like they get that, and we don't. Right. We get their testimony about it, which is valuable, but it's not the same. As, as what Thomas the gets holes here in the hands, putting your hand in the side of Jesus. That's, that's a crazy visual to me to see like yeah. where a spear was. Yeah. You can, you know, it's like put, put your hand in the bullet hole there, you know, like, yes, yeah. it, it, the hole is still there. Put your finger in well, it. That, like, I also crazy. imagine that, that that is like men in their thirties and twenties, thirties and forties being men. In, hey dude, you want to poke it? You want to poke yeah. my sick scar? <laughs> Do you want to poke <laughs> Thomas? Do you want to yeah. poke my sick? I've got a sick scar, look, bro. Look how gnarly this looks. Check it out. Yeah. Check. It's <laughs> it's totally gnarly, bro. Like you yeah. should. Yeah, that's my like. That is my image of what this is. Is like. Um, yeah. Anyways, like, and for me, this is really important. I I think for me on a very personal level, this is really important. I allude to it to the piece of like. Uh, you know, I have very distinct memories, and I've talked about it on the show before, of going to the church camps, of going to the big Christian music festivals, and at some point there comes the altar call um, of like, if you believe, just raise your hand, and I'm like, and then I see all these people around me having these like experiences that I'm just not, right, that it's just not landing for me. And feeling just utterly left out because it wasn't for lack of trying. And eventually, you know, obviously I'm here. Eventually I I did find faith in my own way. But they pitched it as so easy. And what I appreciate about Jesus here is that Jesus is not pitching it as easy. He is saying... He is blessing the struggle of, hey, y'all are struggling, and I'm going to, y'all, the disciples, are struggling, and I'm going to help you with that. I'm going to show up. Mm-hmm. I'm going to let you touch my sick scar, bro. Um, <laughs> I'm going to give you what you need. I may chide you about, you know, Mark, certainly, he, and he's going to chide him a little bit. But in the end, he also doesn't cast them out. Right. Um, and so he's going to honor their journey. And then these words of blessing our journey, our journey to faith, because there is like a real, like I feel in those words, like, oh, I'm not, I know it's hard, 
I'm not judging you for this. I'm not judging you that this was a journey. Blessed it's, are it's those almost, who get there. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's almost a vindication for those who are skeptics, yeah. right? Who don't get it right yeah. away. And I, I don't actually love the term that the, you know, the headings in your, your chapter headings in scripture called Thomas doubting Thomas. Um, because right. he, he didn't doubt any more than any of the other disciples, right? He was just verifying. I like verifying Thomas because there's nothing wrong yeah. with with verifying, right? There's nothing wrong well, with asking the questions and seeking that truth and then finding it, right? The, the journey well, is different that, for everybody. That's what... That's where the sermon, that's where I took this in the sermon in particular is like, hey, in the end, you need to have your own personal experience with this. Yes. Like the sermon was entitled um, uh, Doubt Without Experience, right? right? That Thomas isn't doubting. They just had already had their own encounter with the risen Lord. And right. what we see consistently across the entire 20th chapter of John, it's all these people encountering the resurrection and only understanding it when they encounter it themselves, right? Right. Um, Mary tells John and Peter, he's not in there. Right. They dash. John wins the foot race. Right. right. And then but having go seen, <laughs> have, go to verify, then mm -hmm. having seen the empty tomb, John believes. Right. But he had his own encounter. Right. Mary witnessed the empty tomb. Right. Has her own encounter with Jesus. He calls her by name. Now she believes. Rabona, yes. right? Mm -hmm. um, Thomas missed the meeting. I, right. I, I, I like to imagine why did he miss the meeting? Um, and <laughs> I assume that they put him on supplies duty, right? That, yeah, he's uh, you out know, buying these, the fish or whatever. He's out <laughs> buying fish or whatever. Um, and he didn't know. It's not like Jesus posted the times that he was going to arrive. And so Thomas right. was running errands. Um mm -hmm. And so they had this experience, and then he breathes the ruah, breathes the Holy Spirit on them, and they have this. And it's profound. It's got to have been just a profound encounter. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thomas just wasn't there, right? And so then they tell him about it, and he goes, "Yeah, dog, I cool. I don't know yet. yet. Yeah." Yeah, so then he has, he has his own, uh, he has an encounter as they just had an encounter. And he says, my Lord, my God, oh my God. He, he so gets it. Um, each time it is these people having their own encounter with God that ends up being the thing that really matters. Yes. And I, I think I can see it from the other point of view too, of like the disciples who have had their encounter already who are trying to impress upon Thomas yeah. this incredible thing that has just happened to them. And they're having yeah. difficulty making believe like how many times ha after Lord. becoming a Christian, after encountering Christ, after having this amazing experience of, you know, finding faith, finding your, on your journey, whatever that looks like. Yeah. And then you go and you try to tell somebody who hasn't had that yet, or who doesn't believe yet and how frustrating yeah. it can be to go, but no, really, this genuinely no, no, has happened no, no. to me, and this is real, right? This, this is so, faith is this real. Is great. I mean, it's a, oh, I, he, who, this right. is amazing. I is so God stoked. Is real. God and, is and real. They go, you too should go on a walk to Emmaus. Right. But then they go, yeah, but no, nah, no, maybe yeah. not for me, right? And how frustrating yeah, that frustrating that can me. be for, for those of us who have experienced and right. want those that we love to experience it as well. Um, so, I mean, this is in some ways. Patient, and give them their Thomas moment and let them yeah. walk their journey, or right? Let them understand find that, like, this is, a, this is a, as much a story about the struggle of evangelism as anything else, right? <laughs> yes. We, we see the first people who have to tell of the resurrection with right. two people who had not yet had a direct experience of the resurrection, <laughs> and consistently, it's a struggle. Right. Even the, like, Mary to yep. John, like to the first disciples, yep. right? Like how much would she roll her eyes when they run out the door to go double check? She's like, I just told you he's not there. I just to right? I told like, you he's not I just told there. you he's not in the tomb anymore. What are you right. doing? And they still have to go. Well, and that's, life, right? like, <laughs> that's actually the longer, so the longer version of Mark, Jesus shows up and goes, why didn't you believe the women? They told you. Right. What? What's the right. deal? What's your deal here, y'all? <laughs> Bros. 
should have listened to them, the, comma, right. the ladies, comma. <laughs> um, but it is like, you know, again, the Thomas's bros are like, bro, bro, chef, we had this amazing encounter with the risen Lord, bro. And he's like, bro, I didn't. Y'all seem right. stoked. And that's rad. Gnarly. I am so happy for you that you have had this. This is how the this is how the disciples talk to each other in my head. Um, it's a lot of people calling each other Brosif. Um, it's good, Brosif. I get you. I respect to that experience. Yes, we are Theodore. You know Theodore Lou again. Um, right. That's your truth. You live it, bro. Like that, bro. I have not had that experience. Right. And I need to know for myself. And that's all that is. And we, right. ha- and, and I think even in, I think you're right, even in the language we use around it, yeah. we prejudge. And Jesus doesn't, right? Let's be clear. Right. Jesus, Jesus' response is show up again, yes. help Thomas, chide them all that, yeah, y'all think it's, y'all think it's hard. Just yeah. You wait. Wait for the, the people, people you are, are going to be talking to. Thousands of years later, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that we are the ones who judge Thomas. Jesus certainly doesn't. No right. more than he chides all of them in Mark. Um, right. You know, even in I, I read all the post-resurrection stories. They're, they're not long um, for this piece, and like my the the detail from the Great Commission. They are gathered together on the, in Matthew, gathered together on the mountain. They're worshiping. Mm-hmm. Jesus is standing there, and some doubted. And Jesus said, "Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations." Baptist, like, and some doubted is right there. And some doubted, even though Jesus is standing yeah. literally mm-hmm. in the flesh in front of them. Yes. And so <sighs> it, it is, um, a, like this to me. What we how we talk about this text is more a mirror than the, because if you read the te- mirror of us and our thoughts on belief and our often, particularly in uh, like evangelical Protestant Christianity, like really judge doubt and really put a negative spin on and, re- and really like um, try to make this sound really easy and, um, and it just is right. Like it's a mirror back at us because what a- if you read what actually happens in the story and everyone in the story's perspective and then John's tag in verses 30 and 31 of like, hey, I'm, I'm writing this down so that maybe to give y'all a shot at this so that maybe right. y'all will come to believe um, everyone in this story and what how Jesus goes about this story does not do the things that we then do it. Right. right. Give Thomas the label of doubter, even though he's right. just all of the other right. folks that just already had the experience. Right. Exactly. Well, and I, I mean, I think you're right that this does really speak to especially those people who have, you know, been to the big Christian concerts or the Jesus concerts or to the, you know, the retreats or the camps or the summer camps, but they didn't feel the thing at the altar call or they didn't yeah. feel the big emotional high that everybody around them was feeling. Um, just to remember that your faith is not a feeling that it's not just an yeah. emotion that you don't have to. So I've, I've had Sunday school teachers even tell me, you know, okay, so draw a roller coaster of how you felt, you know, like when did you feel closest to God and when did you not? And when were you, you know, believing in God and when did you doubt? And I'm like, those are not the same thing. Um, Because I can believe in God just as much in this valley that I'm in where I am feeling horrible as I can on this mountaintop where I am feeling great at this, you know, Christian retreat center or whatever else. Um, But that your faith can remain constant regardless of your emotion. Um, That you can know that God is there regardless of your circumstance. Um, And so... Well, and that it is... Like, different things are going to, and I, this text is even aware of it, of like, just different things are going to work for different folks. Yeah. And we, we, I think, I, 
I, I don't think I was always really skeptical of this, but I have ended up like recognizing that we need to push against just thinking about a mo thinking about getting people to a moment of salvation. Right. Right. And that that can happen uh, potentially quickly. I get like on Pentecost Day it did. Yes. Um, I also suspect that a lot of the narratives in the New Testament are just compressed for time, right? Like uh, one of the texts that I that came up in the lectionary for this season that I didn't pull, but I've often talked about is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. You have yes. no idea, like so that those of you who don't just like have that story and recall. Good, no, <laughs> I'm so glad you can live that life. Blessed are you. Um, <laughs> Love that. But like, story, so Phil, it's a great story. So Philip encounters and this Ethiopian eunuch has questions about scripture. Then they ride for some distance, like, and he's explaining the scriptures to him. And at the end of it, he's baptized. And it makes it sound like it's a right. few minutes, but that was like could have been days. I mean, we don't it's have a whole journey. Yeah. And they right. went through and, and like showed the scripture and did like, a, it's one of those conversations you wish you were privy to because I'm like, if it worked yeah. for them, let's do it again. Um, but, but it is, it's this verifying of scripture that he has read. Right. Right. And he's having this, like something in how Philip tells it or whatever, something you connects, right. right? Uh, you know, he's already feeling some rumble. He, the Ethiopian eunuch are already feeling some rumblings. And so then in having right. that scripture interpreted, with whatever emotional content that Philip brings to that, then clicks and it works and praise God. But I just think that took longer than like a th really quick car ride. These were right. long journeys. And so we, we think a lot about this moment of salvation and then those are really cool moments. Not everyone has like a moment. Uh, we need to also recognize that for some folks, it's just like things build up over time and then you can't recognize a like, and this is the moment I was saved. Certainly I can't, um, but I can, I can twig like, oh, these are a series of moments that combine together to put me where I am. But to think about that what we are trying to do as church, as religious communities, as you know, believers trying to help other people become believers, is we are just helping people on that journey. But right. in the end, God's the one who's doing the heavy lifting. God yeah. and that person are the doing the heavy lifting, right? God revealing God's self, them maybe receiving that, but like we are supposed to, to me, and I don't think I, I always thought about it like this is we are trying to create a space where folks can go on that journey and feel okay to be on that journey, to feel okay yeah. to look at their brosifs and go, brosif, your, what you're saying is not enough. I need my own experience, which shout out to Thomas for advocating for himself, right? right? Go for, it. for not giving up and for looking at his bros and going, bro, cool respect. I need my own experience. Um, and to, and for us to be able to hear that for us who are like on the other side of this, like, ah, it's totally tubular, uh, to hear, <laughs> to hear our brosifs who are saying, I need my own experience and to go, cool. You haven't had your own experience yet. That's cool. Like we're going to help you and stick with you in this journey and yeah. pray that in that journey, you'll find it. But to not, turn up that heat, you need to get saved right now. Because that right. did not work on me. I it's like uh -huh. or on many, I imagine. On on this several is, people, I imagine. But also, I you know, cynical me, a lot of it is the same people going up over and over again. This is my friend who will remain nameless who got saved every summer. And maybe he needed it. <laughs> but definitely he got saved every summer. Every right. summer, at some point, we'd encounter an altar call, and away he would go. And I'm like, but you did this last summer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Well, and, yeah. So maybe just continuing to create the spaces for people to have the authentic experiences is, is actually what our job is, right? Is recognizing people's journey um, yeah. towards the divine and then creating space for them to do that. Um, without judgment, without calling them Doubting Thomas. <laughs> without judgment, because God isn't judging them. Right. We are. Yes. Right. That the, 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 and this is, I, this is, I think, I think I, again, I, I think maybe I really fully processed 
in this time encountering the text. This is one of those, like, every once in a while, the lectionary wears me out. It's like, I've just, I've preached, like, how do I have a new thing? Every once in a while, you do actually have a new thing. You gain a new perspective <laughs> on a text. And I think this is something that really clicked for me this time, is that, oh, Jesus is literally saying, I'm not judging you right. for this being difficult. I am blessing your journey. So any judgment that ends up in this conversation is not coming from God. Right. It is coming from us mm-hmm. of, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I, maybe I am particularly sensitive to, sensitive to this, not just because I'm the oddball in church, but I'm an oddball in a lot of settings, right? I'm the, the dyslexic kid trying to, who tried to make it in academia, Right. And so, yeah, y'all can do the reading. That's great. That's cute. That's adorable. What if we made this less ableist? Um, and how do I, who am capable of processing this information? Is there a way that we can, you know, I, I, I'm often, for whatever reason, my lot in life seems to be the oddball in whatever setting I'm in. Um, <laughs> and so here I speak up for the faithful oddballs um, who don't find believing that a you know guy rising from the dead 2000 years ago altered the course of human history and can alter the course of my current life because that is i right. do believe that but right. y'all can understand why that sounds a little nuts it's pretty sensational when you think about it right yeah. it is pretty miraculous and so but it is it's kind of like you know if you've experienced disney world or whatever and you're trying to describe it to someone who's never been like, this is a magical thing that's happened to me. It's really impossible. Sometimes we don't have, I have this struggle of describing. I have this struggle trying to explain the grand Canyon to my father-in-law. Okay. Ah. Cause fundamentally I, what he says, and this is true is that it's just a hole in the ground. It is just and a hole in the ground. <laughs> it is just a hole in the ground, <laughs> but I am not, prone to positive hyperbole Uh um i'm a you know deeply depressed individual um (laughs) with largely a grasp of the negative half of the english language when i encountered the grand canyon i did it at sunset it was six degrees outside i didn't have a coat i only had a light jacket and i had bought a beanie at a drugstore because i've I don't, I, I did not, under, I'm from the swamps, I didn't know that deserts got cold. You can yeah. say, Trey, it was January. You're an idiot. You're like a, a mile above sea level. No concept. <laughs> Desert hot, y'all. That's what it was in the cartoons. Okay. So <laughs> just a real failure of Looney Tunes to prepare me for desert cold. <laughs> desert right. hot. Um, the snow on the journey up to the Grand Canyon should have been an indication. Anyways, I'm freezing, right? Um, and I want to mm-hmm. photograph it. And my I don't have gloves. What are gloves? Um, it's like six. Um, and so I'm like dancing around. I'm alternating, like warming my hands. And I am just having this profound experience where I don't even want to photograph it. I want to write poetry. <laughs> not even a great po- – I'm not a poet. I wanted to write poetry about it. It's just – at sunset, the colors, the all the stuff. And I've tried to explain this to my father-in-law, and it just doesn't land. I have failed as an evangelist for the Grand Canyon. And I ended up, like, I, I haven't managed to take him. I took Sydney. Um, and she had she got it, right? Like, you see it, and you get it. You behold the Grand Canyon. And even the pictures you've seen do not explain to you it's why like my photos felt inadequate the only thing that felt adequate was a poem i was not capable of writing um (laughs) and so all of this is just not landing for the people in my life who have not seen the grand canyon and this is something that like look it's national park service it's very easy you know you just need to get yourself to fly getting yourself to flagstaff is the only hard part of this Mm -hmm. and even that i can't like and that's, as, you know, I have a failed evangelist in many ways, but I'm also a failed evangelist for the Grand Canyon. And if it's that difficult for the Grand Canyon, which is easily right. accessible and, you know, stays in one place, it's right there. You just got to go to it. Well, right? it's, it's literal. How, you can just go there. You can just go there, right? 
Yeah. But how much harder to describe yeah. the divine and to evangelize for the divine to people who have not yet experienced any, you know, or have not yet recognized the provenient grace right. that is working in their life from God. How much harder our job is. So maybe we should do be a little bit easier on ourselves too as evangelists. Be, um, be but, easier on ourselves as also, evangelist. Easier, easier on the people who don't get it. Yes. Right. Or the people who really struggle with it or have their ups and downs with it. Right? Like, and maybe mm-hmm. uh, we should just make, I understand that there is value in making it sound easy because it makes God feel accessible. And God mm-hmm. is accessible and faith can also be really challenging. And both of those things can be true. And faith isn't yes. challenging because God is hiding God's self from you. Right. But also, because we don't have the opportunity to pokey pokey, right? Right. It just, Jesus, Jesus knows. Yes. Jesus knows it's hard for you. Yes. And Jesus says, that's okay. You are blessed in your journey. Mm-hmm. Maybe we should bless those <laughs> journeys too. Anyways, if you want to share, I would love if you would share faith journeys. Um Yes. I'm always fascinated about how people get here. And I know for some folks, mm-hmm. like those like big concerts, whatever, like that really works. It like I right. love the music, but in terms of finding Jesus, that's not what worked for me. Um yeah. but I would love to hear those stories. Um the goodness of God pod at gmail.com. That is the goodness of God pod at gmail.com. If you want more of what we do, especially when I'm not behind on making it, um uh, youtube.com slash servants now, facebook.com slash slash servants now or servants now.org on the interwebs um everything we do here is made possible by a generous innovators grant for the texas annual conference of the united methodist church if you want to support the work that we are doing right now like comment subscribe and share as we talked about on last week's how to restart a church help uh, look the algorithms they're bad but also that's that's just the agora man that's just how the it's how this world works um i I suspect there will be in the near future ways for you to more directly support the show. Um, I've had some folks asking like, hey, we don't go to your church. Can we support this thing? And I'm like, yeah, we should probably help let let y'all let y'all make this work a little more sustainable for us, please. Yep. Um, but uh, your likes, your comments, your, your, sub- your subscriptions, uh, your shares, um, tell other people about it. Leave us five star reviews on Apple Podcasts. All those things help us a lot. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next time.